morning again. So today we hear Jesus talking a little bit about family. So a family walks into a bank in New York before they're off for vacation, and they ask for a $5,000 loan. The banker says, okay, is there anything you would like to leave as collateral? And the father of the family says, well, yes, of course, you can have my Rolls Royce. The banker is stunned and says, a $250,000 Rolls Royce, really? The father's completely positive. He hands over the keys, and the loan officers laugh at him. They check his credentials to make sure that he's the title, and he says, he is the owner. Everything checks out. They park the Rolls Royce then under the underground garage for two weeks. When the family comes back, he pays off the $5,000, as well as the $20 in interest. The loan officer says, sir, we very much appreciate your business, but I have a question. When we looked you up, we found that you guys are multimillionaires. Why would you want to borrow 5,000 bucks? Father says, well, where else in New York City can I park my car for two weeks for $20 and expect <laughs> it to be there when I come back? Exactly. <laughs> in today's gospel from Mark, Jesus talks about two important points. He talks about family, and he talks about sin. And the text this morning is an example of Mark, what Mark does often in his gospel, where he sandwiches stories. He begins a story, starts another story, and ends with the first one. And Mark begins our story with Jesus back in his hometown of Nazareth. Mark is saying that there's so many people in the house, it was so crowded where he was, that they could not even eat, which means there was probably no elbow room. They were that packed in. Everybody wants to hear Jesus. Everybody wants to see Jesus. And Mark tells us that Jesus is in there preaching with authority, which is the way that Mark describes Jesus' preaching throughout his gospel. And preaching with authority means that whatever Jesus preached, he got action. In other words, his words produced change in the lives of those who heard them. Jesus' family happens to also be there in Nazareth. And his family is there because some people have come to them and said, Jesus is back, but you better come because he's beside himself. He's different. He's not the guy that we remember when he was growing up. They all think he's lost his marbles. They think he's crazy. His family is embarrassed by this, and they want to take him and bring him home and talk some sense into him. And it's not just Jesus' family helping to also be there. The scribes are there, too. They've come all the way down from Jerusalem. The scribes, if you remember, are authorities in Scripture. I mean, they knew their Scriptures forwards and backwards. If you ever wanted to know anything about Scripture, ask them. They could tell you. And like Jesus' family, they're also there. And the reason they're there is because they want to in inquire or actually interrogate Jesus as to where does he get this power to heal and to forgive sins and to cast out demons? Well, because they don't recognize that the power is from, to Jesus is coming from God himself, they assume that it's coming from Satan's. And so their questioning is all about how are you able to cast out Satan's demons? So this person must be a friend or an ally of Satan. The scribes are saying he's possessed by Beelzebub. The prince of demons. In other words, Jesus is doing the devil's work. But Jesus answers by saying, if Satan is using me to cast out his own demons, then his domain will not last very long. A house divided itself against itself will not stand. It doesn't make any sense. How would the force, Satan, that seeks to destroy good and establish evil, be casting out evil and establishing good. And he says later, we cannot plunder a house without first restraining the owner. And it is Jesus who is coming into the house and tying up the strong man, who is Satan. He's, a, plus he's looking to tie up Satan and reach back and get the souls of those people that Satan has stolen away. Jesus is victorious. And Jesus also then produces another counterpunch. He suggests to the scribes that he was sent from God to forgive sins, to heal, and to cast out demons. And because he was sent from God, then those who reject him 
also reject the spirit of God the Father who has sent him. And this is defined as blasphemy or the unpardonable sin. Historically, writers and scholars through the centuries have written about what is the unpardonable sin. Is it lack of repentance or is it resisting God's grace? Or like the old Calvinist said, a reprobate, which is a person who was already destined to damnation. Our passage suggests that it's simply rejecting the spirit of God and Jesus. And rejecting Jesus' power to forgive and to heal is also rejecting his acting that he did, his act that he did on the cross for us to save us from our sin, to give, offer us forgiveness and eternal life. And so now we come to the question of our own resistance to the Holy Spirit, this unforgivable sin. If we refuse the influence of the Holy Spirit, then we're closing the door on our chance for forgiveness and eternal life. Because remember, sin is separation from God. It separates us from God. And so to sin against the Holy Spirit, to reject the Holy Spirit, is to say no to Jesus, to him being our Savior, our Lord, and separating us from him. Jesus' statement in our gospel about the unforgivable sin says so much more about us than it does about God. <clears throat> because there's absolutely no sin which God is not willing to forgive. You say murder? Yes. Adultery? Yes. Idolatry? Yes. Lying? Yes. Coveting, stealing, using the name of God in vain? Yes, to all of those. All of them can be forgiven if people truly repent. And you have to accept Jesus also who forgives all our sin. In other words, according to the Gospel of Mark, there is a limit to God's forgiveness. And that limit is that God cannot forgive those who reject his spirit and his very existence. Because if in your mind or their minds he doesn't exist, so then how can something that doesn't exist forgive those who don't believe he exists? And now at this point in the story, someone tells Jesus, Hey, your mother and brothers are outside. They're all looking for you. Jesus then replies, Who are my mother and my brothers? Then he looked at all the people seated around him, and he says, Here are my brothers and my mother. Whoever does God's will is my brother, my sister, and my mother. That sounds a little cold, sounds a little harsh. It sounds like Jesus is having a little problem with his family. What? Jesus, Jesus, having problem with his family? I mean, we're accustomed to encountering families with trouble in the Old Testament. Cain and Abel, Noah and his family, Jacob and Esau. But Jesus? There were problems in Jesus' family? Well, the problem Jesus has with his family is that they're trying to keep him from doing what God has sent him to do all along. They want to take him back home. Beloved of God, a large number of families will have problems at some time. Families have their headaches, their heartaches. Having families not easy sometimes. They have problems. And if Jesus has problems with his family, then I guess we shouldn't be surprised when we have problems in ours too. And that's the one thing we observe that he talks about, about family. That you will have problems sometimes. And the other thing he says is that he redefines what family is. He's saying family is not so much about your bloodlines or what you're born into. Family is, by the is shown by the love and respect of members for one another. A family is all about the love shown to each member. Mutual commitment is more important than genes that you share. Jesus asked, who are my mother and my brothers? On the surface, like I said, it seems like a pretty harsh thing to say. Did he mean to reject his family altogether? Well, in his book, The New Being, theologian Paul Tillich points out that Jesus did not say 
those outside are not my mother or my brothers. In other words, he didn't deny having a relationship with them. He didn't deny his biological family. He merely expanded the family circle to include others who were not in the bloodline. He pointed to a spiritual rather than a physical kinship as basis for life in the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying that biology is only a small part of what makes you a family. Your family can also consist of those people who have committed themselves to be there for you when trouble comes. So from our text, you see that there's family, the one that you're born into, and then there's family, the family of God, or as I call it, our church family. And by the way, we don't need to worry about Jesus' relationship with his family and the troubles that he had because at the end, when he was at the cross, his mom was there. In the early church, who was instrumental in founding that early church? His mother and his brother, James. With time, everyone in his family came to realize that he wasn't this crazy guy that seemed at first, that he was not of Satan, but of God. And in his resurrection was the victory. Jesus is saying that those who accept the Holy Spirit will do the will of God and become part of that new concept he has of family that Jesus has created. That is, they will all be one family, the family of God. This does not mean to exclude biologic family. Beloved of God, when we allow that Holy Spirit to work in our lives, we accept that Holy Spirit to come into our lives, we receive the power that comes from God, the power to do awesome things. And when we unite with fellow believers, like we do on Sundays, our godly family, and that power is even greater. So in other words, there's family, and then there's family. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help our families to be thankful for one another. Remove any bitterness that was caused by past wounds. Take them away from our hearts. Relieve our families from fear and anxiety and grant us all quiet minds. Father, we ask that you always with us and our families and fill us with peace and joy. We ask that you help our family to be grateful for each member. And this will bind us together as a family and to help us pray for one another. And our prayers for each other will unify us in gratitude and love. Father, give us the grace to put you first in everything that we do for the glory of your name. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.